Hi, my guest today is a visionary academician, a nano scientist, an alumnus of Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and he got his PhD from State University of New York, who has made exceptional interdisciplinary contributions in nanosciences and nanotechnology fields. Since January 9, 2015, he has been serving as a secretary of the Science and Technology Ministry. He wants to steer policy towards the newer directions and needs necessitated by a rapidly changing world. India has come out with a draft policy titled Science Technology Innovation Policy 2020 in short STIP 2020, a holistic and pragmatic blueprint aiming to reorient science, technology and innovations in terms of priorities, sectoral focus and strategies. The draft policy document version 1.4 has been placed for feedback from the public and experts after detailed four track process of consultations. One of the highlights of the India's 2020 and 21 budget was government's new investment plan in quantum computing. India's finance minister had proposed to provide an outlay of 8,000 crore, which is equivalent to more than a $1 billion over a period of five years for the national mission on quantum technologies and applications. However, it is not clear how much funding the government transferred in the first year. A close view of international scenario gives significant developments in quantum technologies. From 2010 onwards, multiple governments have established programs to explore quantum technologies such as UK National Quantum Technologies Program, which created four quantum hubs, the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore, and the QTEC, a Dutch center to develop a topological quantum computer. In December 2018, the then US President Donald Trump signed into a law the US National Quantum Initiative Act with a billion dollar year budget commitment. The European Commission responded to the Quantum Manifesto, which was signed by 3,400 scientists in 2016 with a quantum technology flagship, a Euro. 1 billion 10 year long mega project. It is also learned that China is building the world's largest quantum research facility with a planned investment of approximately 10 billion euros. Similarly, Canada, Australia, Japan, and UK are also preparing national initiatives. How India's science and technology initiatives are shaping on the ground? Professor Ashutosh Sharma, who is spearheading India's scientific missions joins me from New Delhi. Uh, you <laughs> talked about two things. Uh, one is the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy 2021. Uh, indeed, it's very ambitious in its scope and it could not have been conceived even 10 years ago. Uh, the reason is future, the technology future is coming at us at faster and faster rate. Nobody could have anticipated that. Uh, so you gave one example of quantum technologies. Another mission that we started last year was on cyber physical systems. Also with a good investment of rupees 3,660 crores, already 25 hubs have been established and they are going full force at it. We are very close to it now. Uh, we wanted to do a good job. Uh, it's gone through many, many versions and revisions and so on. Um, it's nearly ready now for a cabinet note. Uh, so hopefully that in the next few months, uh, this should be released. Can we see the light on the policy within this financial year? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so before that, uh, before uh, the end of this year, and in fact, much before that, I'm hoping. The National Mission on Quantum Technologies quantum, and I'm, yes, I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So, so first of all, let's understand that uh, while uh, this mission has been announced in the budget for 8,000 crore rupees, um, it's not like we have been waiting for this mission. Even two years ago, uh, the Department of Science and Technology seeded activities in quantum technologies with an investment of 300 crores for a couple of years. So what is the meaning of that? You see, we must have the foundation ready when you are ready actually to pump all the resources in it, uh, which means that we must have human resources, we must have infrastructure, we must have understanding of people that what are the real problems and how are we going to be start working on it. So foundational layer was already laid uh, in the last couple of years, uh, which means mapping our capacity and capability and uh, you know who is going to be doing what and stuff like that, the structure of the mission, the architecture of the mission and the processes of the mission. 
uh, which which are in fact a huge departure from the way we were doing things earlier, uh, which is again that this is actually in the final uh, form nearly. Uh, and last couple of months, uh, we have been tying in working with different ministries, which are equal stakeholders for this mission. Uh, what are these ministries? For example, of course, the strategic uh, ministries, DRDO, uh, ISRO, um, and uh, MITEE, of course, uh, and, and so on. Um, and uh, you know CSIR and everybody else. So they are all on board now, so that therefore we have a very well-rounded, integrated mission, uh, which is not like you know standalone. So it uh, you know it involves everybody, industry in a big way, uh, for example. So all of that is ready now, and so again that this is going to be moved as a cabinet note in the next couple of months or earlier. So we are at the last leg now. Of course, the activities, like I said, have not stopped uh, in between. They are going full force ahead. The major challenges that 2020 put before the world helped India emerge as a forerunner in underscoring the critical role of science and technology in bringing positive transformations for a safe, secure, better society, well prepared for the future. I just want to ask you, how do you view the outlook for India's growth trajectory in the next five years in our science and technology yeah so i mean uh, of course the short answer is that uh, that is very positive trajectory i'm very uh, optimistic about where we would be in five years from now let's actually start understanding this a little bit deeper uh, the first thing i would say is oftentimes people don't realize that we have actually a very deep strength in science and technology now how do we know that well, one of the indicators uh, is that uh, India is number three in the number of scientific publications in respected peer reviewed journals, the standard journals. Uh, this is despite all the constraints that we talk about all the time. And there are constraints, no doubt, but despite all of that, uh, in terms of our human resources, in terms of infrastructure, especially in last few years being built uh, and all of that and innovation, uh, even in terms of number of startups, we are number three in the world. Uh, so all of this is happening with some speed. Now it has to pick up a scale. So often then your next question would be, if we are so good at science and technology, if we have so much deep strength in terms of our R&D labs, in terms of IITs, ICERs, uh, you know, universities and so on, then why is it that, uh, you know, all of these fruits of science and technology are not translating? It's a very fair question, uh, and it is a question that we need to address very squarely. So oftentimes, the clarity is not there that people uh, that people confuse uh, the creation of knowledge with utilization of knowledge. So while you are saying, hey, is there a great weakness in our science and technology? That great weakness is at the interface, uh, interface and connect uh, between uh, produce, uh, producing of knowledge and consuming of that knowledge. Now, in the other ways to put it is like push and pull of knowledge. Unless they match like this, you may have push, 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 but it's not going anywhere because there's no taker, right? So this is an added dimension of science and technology. All those countries which do great in science and technology overall in terms of economic impact of that, they do it because not only because of the muscle of producing knowledge, but also using that knowledge for which the industrial sector has to be very, uh, you know, uh, very modern in their outlook, if you would. And that happens when you become globally competitive, which means that you have to compete at the cutting edge of science and technology. Uh, and all of that is now beginning to happen, I, I think, in the country, so that there's a greater respect for knowledge and knowledge economy, as we call it. You have pioneered in diversifying science and technology talent to effectively develop required technologies in the ongoing fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So outlook for science technology, of course, is great. It is developing rapidly, but it's also about our processes. This is what I was talking about. Uh, you know, science technology works best when the processes of invention and innovation work together. Uh, and that is happening. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the liberalization of many sectors that use science and technology is happening at unprecedented uh, rate. Uh, I'll give you just one example. 
you see there is one organization called survey of india with department of science and technology responsible for surveying mapping all of these activities they, they are so important for planning for governance uh, for infrastructure for services for everything and uh, now now we realize the importance of this sector but our processes were so old uh, and so old fashioned that in order to do any surveying and mapping you need 6 to 8 months of approval tedious approval processes at that rate we will not match the modern rates of doing things imagine if your infrastructure project is held up for 6 months what is the impact on economy and we, th- that becomes a routine thing but now we put in a new policy and guidelines for surveying and mapping no which is liberalization of this sector which will have a huge impact because it's now using modern technology drones uh, lidar uh, digital data and all of that what does it mean this liberalization it means that you need no approvals actually to do surveying and mapping at all right so it is such a huge change uh, today this business of surveying is worth about 20000 crore rupees in the next 7 years it would be 1 lakh crore rupees and there is a direct business of surveying the impact on economy is several several folds more like i pointed out when you want to do planning when you want to do development there is a new scheme called swamitva just imagine that would be made possible by this science and technology using these policy and guidelines what does swamitva mean it means is the people in rural areas they don't own papers for their land what does what does that mean it means countless litigation it means they cannot go to a bank and get loan once you have that uh, then you know it opens up the entire sector of economy the rural economy so other words now the money would start flowing from urban to rural uh, for development because simply because they, they are empowered they can take loans so these are examples of uh you know what you can do with the help of policies that make it possible for science and technology uh to become uh, agents of change and transformation so why why science and technology has always been there right point is how how do you bring it into action uh and so that is the reason liberalization democratization uh, of the processes of science uh, is what would make it so widespread that it serves the larger needs of society the question yeah. that you were asking about covid-19 uh, so the first wave of covid-19 uh, we had done a mapping of all our startups there are about 140 incubators supported by dst which have about 3500 technology startups uh, in fact a third party analysis last year uh, showed that they generated they created uh, rupees 27000 crores of new wealth in last 5 years and they created more than 60000 direct jobs this is before they become unicorns and stuff right so uh, so you see this is a movement which has really started and we leveraged this movement for covid 19 uh, so uh, after mapping about 600 startups uh, we selected more than 70 and gave them uh, the seed money to develop different products uh, more more than 3 dozen of these project uh, products already commercialized and in the market they vary across the entire spectrum of what i talked about from ventilators uh, ppes n95 mask uh, okay. diagnostics and not just limited to you see when we started it, it was more about the regular you know diagnostic kits for rt pcr but today more advanced versions are being supported for example you need to know not only that you are infected but what kind of variant are you infected with for example that you are able to differentiate between them Uh, at the same time um, you know you should not have false negatives so that some variant is not captured by that diagnostic kit uh, at the same time you want to let's say in antibody test uh, you want to know not just that you have antibodies but what is the level at which you have antibodies of different kinds so you can track them after vaccination you can track them after infection uh, and so on so whole lot of uh, other thing that uh, that we have done it is not just producing products and technologies which has happened uh, and in the second covid wave then there was a oxygen requirement so those kind of companies uh, are being funded and in fact three of them are already in market within one month okay so that again proves the point that if we have uh, a purpose you know if that purpose is well defined 
if there is a market demand then people would actually come and meet it but in addition to that see covid 19 or indeed any pandemic of this kind in the future you have to be uh, prepared on several fronts it's not just about you know this is the short term measure what is the long term measure medium term measure it means that we have for example facilities that characterize the behavior of virus 12 new such facilities which are called bsl3 and bsl4 uh, they are being established uh, there our mathematical modeling groups uh, are being established a very large number of them so that you have continuity is not a one time thing you see you cannot you cannot uh, just wake up overnight and say tomorrow deliver me that so that would not happen so therefore we need to keep our foundations whether infrastructure or people ready for any of these uh, you know challenges uh, that may arise also in the future as well as lot of uh, funding uh, for basic uh, science aspects of virus right so that information will remain with us forever uh, it would be you know so 3 years from now 2 years 5 years it has to be a continuous program and all of that has been seeded professor do you see any possibility for exporting technologies being developed in india oh absolutely uh, so no so for, so the exporting technologies depend on two factors the first factor is that this is like kind of globally competitive can be benchmarked against the good products uh, it should be uh, you know also uh, in terms of price competitive so while technologically it is comparable okay in terms of price it has an advantage and also the third aspect which is in india's favor is that there are many markets for example in asia in africa in south america which have similar needs and priorities as ours uh, and so they really uh, uh, look up to us uh, in saying okay do you have this you know to solve my problems and we have been working on that front for last 4 years at least that i'm aware of Uh, is to showcase our products in africa uh, in many uh, other you know uh, eastern countries and so on we have very special schemes uh, working with these countries in terms of bringing their scientists and fellowships and so on but also showcasing what is it that we have to offer them and i i, I suspect that this is going to happen much more uh, in the next few years than it did in the last several years uh, so certainly since we do satisfy these three criteria which is the relevance uh, which is the price and which is uh, being technologically globally competitive your ministry has been allocated 14793 plus crore in the budget in the recently of course it is a definitely 20% hike uh, compared to previous year and your three departments dst dbt and uh, dsir done excellent uh, contributions in the last couple of years of course we wish they continue to do so so what's your road map for the current fiscal year and the outlook for your deep ocean mission so uh, first of all let me clarify that the deep ocean mission is uh, uh, basically ministry of earth sciences project of course we are all involved in it uh, that has already been approved Uh, by the cabinet so now it is in the process of being launched uh, so that is very good that's happening and deep ocean mission you know this is the 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 depth dimension to what was space uh, earlier so since we have been very good at space now it's time to do deep dive uh, in there and open this front now uh, as far as uh, the so your question was uh, that what is it that we want to do this year this year this financial year. yeah the financial year so of course in addition to continuing you know stuff that has been going on there are four new policies that we are going to notify very soon uh, one of them you already talked about the national policy on science technology innovation the second policy is related to geospatial sector data and so on the third policy uh, is about uh, scientific infrastructure from cradle to grave what i mean by that is how do you create purposeful scientific infrastructure how do you maintain it how do you use it how do you share it very important and how do you dispose of it uh, so so that would bring another muscle in our science technology processes and the fourth policy voluntary is about scientific social responsibility the another um, uh, very new uh, scheme uh, 
uh, that we have started is a pilot this year, which would be scaled up, which is called Vigyan Jyoti. The idea is like this. When I was doing B.Tech in an IIT, there were 3% women there. Now, today, there may be 12-15% in core areas of engineering, which means in 40 years, we have come, not made significant progress. How is that going to happen? So, there are four or five different aspects of what holds back women getting into top engineering technology colleges, and they have no leadership there. They have no great deal of role models there. Uh, how do we create that? Uh, so the, this Vigyan Jyoti scheme holistically will address all the four or five parameters that hold them back from financial aspects uh, to, to training or coaching aspects to cultural aspects uh, to bringing the confidence uh, both in their teachers, their parents, what have you, uh, all of that. So this is another, uh, to my mind, so while this is not hardcore science, right, but this is so needed. Uh, in order to have you know diversity and all that. Next thing that we are going to do uh, is, like I said, this innovation ecosystem. Want to scale it up to 5x. So today, if we have 3,500 tech startups, how do I take them to 15,000? Uh, it, it's just within next five years. Uh, and so there's a new model, which is I call distributed innovation, uh, which empowers our entrepreneurs uh, and, uh, you know, these people who don't have to be in one physical space, but basically you are able to provide them everything else that they need except the space. Uh, and with that model, uh, we will go, uh, you know, uh, a long way there. Uh, just to give you some example, there's also a lot of push, uh, you know, in digital technologies. So I'll give you an example. When I look at Wikipedia, you see everybody consults Wikipedia as a central source uh, for information and knowledge. But if you look at pages in even Hindi, which is a maximum number of pages of any Indian language, uh, this would be 100 times smaller, not 100, uh, a factor of thousands of times smaller than other you know, global languages. So democratization of scientific information requires that we create in Indian languages, for example, resources like Wikipedia. And how are you going to do that? The task is so daunting. Uh, so we have a model which we have started now uh, in um, one IAT and it's going to be three more. Basically machine translation, the first cut, and the, then create an army of people which do manual intervention, the final cut, saying, okay, I mean, is it translated well? Now using artificial intelligence, uh, actually the engine that would do machine translation uh, will also get trained over time. So it will do better and better job with manual intervention where every time you correct it, then it learns. So, so this is the way to the future. Uh, and so the, this is an example of the kind of projects uh, that we want to bring in and are bringing in, um, right? So, so this one year, uh, of course, uh, what, what we are going to be doing, we have lots of new ideas uh, in doing these kind of things, uh, which is the use of science and technology. I also say that we have an OTT channel, uh, which is called India Science is the only uh, channel which is India-centric on science and technology. Uh, it creates a couple of hours of live programming every day, and it has a huge library. Uh, now uh, it is going to be reaching out uh, pro bono on Geo platform to a couple of crore people. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is everything you want to know about science and technology with the help of the best of experts and good quality production. Uh, is what you would find on India Science. So, Professor Ashutosh Sherpa, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Radha Krishna. It's been so nice talking to you.